Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by Allstate and CIBC. Good evening y bienvenidos to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Michael Puente, reporter with WBEZ Chicago. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. The Segundo Ruiz Belvis Cultural Center turns 50 this month. We'll talk to the leader of the Afro-Latin Arts Organization about what's next. The latest on an effort to repeal Illinois' HIV transmission law, which critics say criminalizes those living with HIV AIDS. We introduce you to the world of freak bikes. Meet the people who create these custom rides. If we don't do something about it, it's going to be done to us. And I would rather go out with a fight than sit here and allow something to happen to me. And Humboldt Park natives Marisa Diaz Arce and Brianna Ramirez Smith give la última palabra on why they say supporting small businesses saves communities. First off tonight, Chicago's oldest Latino cultural institution celebrates its 50th birthday this month. The Segundo Ruiz Belvis Cultural Center has brought Afro-Latin dance, music, and art to Chicago's west side since 1971, and it's persevered through one of the most difficult years arts organizations have ever faced. Joining us to talk about 50 years of Afro-Latin arts and what is to come is the organization's executive director, Omar Torres Courtright. Omar, welcome to Latino Voices. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, absolutely. Very excited. Omar, for viewers who may not be familiar with your organization, can you give us a quick history of the Segundo Ruiz Belvis Cultural Center and its mission? Yes, yeah, so uh, we're the oldest uh, Latino cultural center in Chicago. We've been around since 1971, like you mentioned. And um, it was the, the, the cultural center came out of an initiative from the Latin American Defense Organization, which you could say was the group of citizens, uh, Latinos that were very much active in uh, seeking, uh, you know, um, a better position of Latinos in general and uh, fighting for uh, justice and equality in the 70s. Uh, so that small group that came of, out of Association House, which is a very well-known nonprofit here, uh, formed uh, what would later be called the Segundo Ruiz Belvis Cultural Center. And since then, it has been 50 years of uh, arts, uh, music, culture, uh, and also uh, many, uh, a lot of activism in the history of Segundo Ruiz Belvis. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, a very rich history and definitely the, the first organization, probably the one thing that we're most known about is that it's the first organization that really developed Afro-Puerto Rican music in Chicago. Omar, as we know, organization like the Segundo Ruiz Belvis has had to make lots of adjustments over the last year. Here's a clip from a Zoom performance Segundo Ruiz Belvis produced to support musicians and keep their arts alive during the pandemic. <laughs> It was a hard year for all nonprofits, but especially those like yours that depend on funds from selling tickets to performances. Can you tell us about the significance of that song? Yeah, that that song means a lot to us because uh, it was it was born here at Segundo Ruiz Belvis. Uh, you could say that the first time that that, that it was played, it was uh, in the context of Hurricane Maria. But the song is about resilience, so it really. What I love about it is that it was composed by a musician that is a resident artist of Segundo Ruiz Belvis, uh, Chris Suarez, and it, it's about resilience. So it's a universal theme that could very much be applied to, to the pandemic. And uh, we decided to do our own uh, little pandemic version, you know, the, the, what, the way that, that artists are uh, were doing in the pandemic. And it, it, now it's gonna be in, in an actual album where we're gonna come out with probably the first Plena exclusive album. And when I say Plena is uh, one of the forms of Afro-Puerto Rican music uh, that is uh, most, most known, uh, that Puerto Rico is most known for. 
Omar, what other ways did your organization adjust the last year because of the pandemic? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a, a year of, of many challenges and also a lot of learning and a lot of uh, about a lot of listening to our community of artists, mm -hmm. listening and, and living up to the historic moment where we are right now. So all of those things uh, come into play and um, and that made us look at our at our history and 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 what we stand for and what are the priorities of the organization. So um, we had to pivot. Um, our parking has served both as parking lot for musicians that are coming in small groups to rehearse, but also as a COVID testing site. Um, we had vaccination events where we were uh, combining arts and culture with vaccination in a very ingenious way, uh, calling it Agujita y su combo, uh, and and we brought all these musicians uh, that were playing outside live for the people that were waiting in line, and then we had DJs inside create a very festive atmosphere because it was a celebration that we had so many people uh, at our space that chose our space and trusted us to get vaccinated. We were literally pe uh, uh, pulling people from the street that 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 we know if. If we hadn't asked them to to come and get vaccinated, maybe they wouldn't have done it. Uh, one of the guys said, "I don't even have an ID," and he was walking down the street. And we said, "You know what? That doesn't matter. We still can vaccinate you." And uh, and and I think that that level of trust that we have in the community, mm -hmm. it's also very important when you're asking people to get vaccinated. So, of course, we had our our online virtual concerts where we even produced a documentary in Puerto Rico during the pandemic at an abandoned school in Puerto Rico. We called it Abrazo Virtual. And this entire series of performances was an opportunity for artists to get out there and really perform when nobody really was hiring them. So we tried to do a little bit of both. We tried to live up to the moment and provide it for the community uh, to the extent of our resources and also to provide to our artists and our youth which uh, mm -hmm. our youth continued uh, uh, being a part of our programs and we continued our virtual programs with the youth as well. But well, Omar, this is a full year of celebrations for you. What can people look forward to this month and in the rest of the year? Yeah, it so happens that this is probably the last most active days of, of, of this whole celebration in June, right? But, uh, but then we're gonna continue throughout. But some of the highlights are right now, we're in the middle of the last weekend of the Raices to Roots production. Raices to Roots is uh, it's a local uh, initiative that was born also here at Segundo Rizveldi. So we're helping these artists develop original work that, that was produced during the pandemic. And we finally get an opportunity to show it to the public. This is the last weekend that we're gonna be showing it. And we're gonna have performances uh, tonight. We're gonna have performances on Saturday and Sunday. And then uh, we also have a cooking class, the, the virtual cooking class phenomenon, which is obviously has picked up during the pandemic. And we have a local chef by the name of Roberto Perez and his company Urban Pilon are teaching people how to make arepas de coco, which is a typical plate from the island of Vieques, which is part of the Puerto Rican archipelago. And then we have um, to close the month, uh, not other than our collaboration as an official partner with the MCA, at Tuesdays on the Terrace, where instead of jazz, which is the classic form of music that is shown at Tuesdays on the Terrace, uh, we're gonna spice it up and bring our salsa musicians. And we were able to get a full salsa band. But the most important part is that Edwin Sanchez and Papo Santiago, two of the greatest and biggest stars of the local mm -hmm. salsa scene, are gonna be doing original work and original wow. arrangements. Omar, we got a, just a short time now, but before we let you go, the movie version of Lin-Manuel Miranda's stage musical, In the Heights, was recently released and encountered some pushback for the lack of Afro-Latino representation in his cast. What are your thoughts about that controversy? Yeah, I think that um, I think that now is the time to listen. And uh, I think that the reaction of Lin-Manuel was actually very positive. Uh, and, and, and I think that this is about even working with our allies and the people that are pushing the Puerto Rican culture and that are making our culture known, those are the first people that we should hold accountable. And, and I think that uh, that really calling attention to this issue is important. 
and I think it was recognized. So I think it's that fine balance between, yes, calling out uh, because that's what we should do, and also knowing where our allies are and, and trying to work with them uh, so that we can all be better. Well, our thanks to Omar Torres Courtright. Thank you. Up next, an effort to repeal Illinois' HIV transmission law. Stay with us. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker's signature would repeal the state's so-called HIV criminal transmission statute. The law currently makes it illegal for people living with HIV to have unprotected sex without disclosing their status to their sexual partners. Critics of the law argue it criminalizes having HIV AIDS, especially in communities of color, while doing almost nothing to slow its spread. Joining us now with more is Adam Rhodes, social justice reporter for the Chicago Reader, where they recently wrote about the law's history and the current repeal effort co-published by Injustice Watch. Adam, welcome to Latino Voices. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Well, first of all, explain exactly what this law does. So the law makes it a felony punishable by up to seven years in prison for knowingly exposing someone to HIV um, without taking measures to um, protect the other person. It, uh, the updated law uh, makes, it, uh, makes it illegal not to use a condom in a sexual setting and also makes it illegal to um, uh, donate blood, tissue, organs, things like that, and to share non-sterilized drug paraphernalia, paraphernalia like needles. Mm -hmm. Adam, when was the statue adopted and what, was, what inspired its passage in the first place? Yeah, so it was passed in actually 1989, right at the height of the AIDS crisis in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and the law was pretty much fueled by that crisis and by a lot of stigma, homophobia and racism um, that all worked together at that time. Mm -hmm. How has the law been enforced in Chicago and across the state? Um, so in Chicago, the law has predominantly been used against people of color. Uh, two thirds of the people of the charges that I analyzed were against black men and 75% of these 60 charges that I analyzed were against black people across gender lines. Mm -hmm. um, I talked to a couple of counties, the, the I believe four most populous counties besides Cook in mm -hmm. Illinois and all of those counties had charged either no one with under the law or either one or two. Mm -hmm. Adam, critics say the law criminalizes living with HIV AIDS. What's their main argument for that? So the main argument behind that is comes from the studies that prove that these laws actually limit testing, limit adherence to medication, um, and even essentially do the exact opposite of what they claim to do. And so in light of that, these um, the activists pushing for repeal say that it's not that these laws aren't actually doing what they claim to be doing and are just punishing people for living with this virus. As you know, Illinois is one of around 30 states that have similar laws on the books. Is there an effort to rethink these statues nationwide? Um, I think on a state by state level, there are definitely some states that have um, rethought and repealed these criminal statutes or at least amended them. Um, I think Virginia was one of the most recent ones. Um, but on a national level, because um, there's such a patchwork of this legislation, there isn't a federal or um, I don't think there's a federal response just yet. Mm -hmm. Adam, in your recent article, you profile several people who have been charged under this law. What's your takeaway from their stories? Um, the biggest takeaway that I got from these stories is that these charges are just so destructive and so harmful to these people's lives. Um, I don't think there was anyone that I spoke with whose life hadn't been uprooted significantly in some way. Um, Jimmy Amutabi had to leave a career he was passionate about. Tammy Hott's husband suffered significant um, mental health issues as a result 
Um, there really isn't just an example of this law being used in a way that has not led to just devastating harm for people. Adam, CDC data shows the proportion of HIV infections across the country has risen steadily in Latino and black communities in recent decades. What barriers remain for people with HIV in those communities to seek treatment? I think the biggest barrier is always going to be stigma. It's always going to be um, those lasting misconceptions about what the HIV virus is, who it impacts, um, and just the state of one's life after being diagnosed. And particularly with the Latino community, you know, there's all of that machismo um, and a lot of those misconceptions just about uh, queerness and homosexuality. And then when you pair that with a disease that is um, Kind of paired with that same community then there's going to be a lot of barriers to then fighting that virus adam i understand the repeal effort also hopes to change a statute on how people living with hiv can or cannot donate blood and other bodily fluids how does that currently work um, i'm admittedly not super sure about that i believe that on the federal level men who have sex with men are not allowed to donate blood and unfortunately, because men who have sex with men are a large population of the people living with HIV, I believe that barrier will stay. How soon do you think this law will be repealed? Um, I don't have an exact guess. I'm hoping, and I and advocates uh, hope that the law will be repealed during Pride Month just because of the symbolism, um, but it's really just up to J.B. Pritzker's timeline, unfortunately. And do you know, at least in Cook County, when's the last time uh, the state's attorney has used this law? It was 2016. 2016, all right. And do you know the outcome of that? Was the person actually convicted? Uh, I believe the person died during the case. Oh, okay, all right. Well, our thanks to Adam Rhodes. Up next, the unusual way some cyclists get around, stick around. Have you ever thrown out a broken bike or any of its spare parts? There's a chance a local bike club scooped up that trash to make a work of art on wheels. Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia recently visited Logan Square to learn about the city's bustling custom bike culture. 14-year-old Malcolm Langford is riding a tall bike for the first time. It was pretty scary, but it's, it's pretty cool. It's like, it's like way different, so it's just like, whoo, I'm so high. <laughs> Unusual bikes of all shapes and sizes are here at Logan Square Park. Tall ones, long ones, even a giant rat on wheels. Custom bikes to me is just a representation of yourself, you know, like the clothes you wear represent you, the things you do that, you know, so the bike you ride can also represent you and, and some of us are just a little weirder than others, I guess. Chris Costellan is a member of the local bike club Rat Patrol, which started in 1999. So most of this stuff that I make uh, would come out of the uh, alleys, out of the trash, people's leftovers that uh, I'd find and bring home and turn into my, my gold. Rat Patrol and other bike groups typically scour alleyways for spare bike parts, which they weld into wild creations, like this grill bike made of several bikes, a moving cart, and of course, a charcoal grill. The inspiration behind the grill bike was we like to eat and party and we want to take it wherever we go. So we said, you know, let's build something that we can actually take the grill um, to the park or to the beach. This swing bike, which looks quite precarious as its two wheels swing out of alignment, was built by 19-year-old Aiden Lowry. I've never seen someone make one before, so it seemed like a really wild idea. So you can put it to the left of you or right up in front of you. It really feels free and floaty. Through organizing public meetups and scavenging for disposed bike parts, the Rat Patrol aims to foster a do-it-yourself, sustainable approach to bike riding, according to this club member, who goes by the name Wiley Coyote. Rat Patrol always wants to see more people do things themselves, how to build their own bikes, how to maintenance their own bikes, and how to, you know, divert bikes from the waste stream. The isolation brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic inspired Juan Lucero to embrace Chicago's custom bike scene and introduce his daughters to this inventive hobby. It's a very family-oriented thing uh, for me, specifically because we all need exercise, we need to get out, the pandemic's been happening. 
Uh, so that's where I really got into it a lot. And even the kids, I said, come on, like, let's just go out. We got to go out uh, a couple days a week and, and go ride somewhere. I just think that they have a lot to say, but, you know, they put it in their bikes and stuff. And um, it's just really cool designs. And it's just something really great that they're doing. I definitely want to do something like that and make a big bike. I think it's really cool how sometimes when me and my dad ride down the street, a bunch of people stare at you, but in a good way. So I wanna <laughs> keep doing that. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Evan Garcia. If Juan Lucero and his daughters look familiar, that's because they're part of a family mariachi band, Celito Lindo, that our very own Jay Shevsky profiled five years ago. You can visit our website to see that story and learn more about the Rat Patrol Bike Club and their local meetups. The forces of gentrification can make people being priced out of their neighborhoods feel powerless. But the founders of Lolita's Bodega in Humboldt Park say residents have more power than they think and it's in their pockets. Here, Brianna Ramirez-Smith and Marisa Diaz-Arce give la última palabra on what they say everyone can do to invest in their communities. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. All right. Hi, I'm Brianna Ramirez-Smith. I'm Marisa Diaz-Arce. And, and we are? Lolita, <laughs> no, <laughs> that doesn't work. Okay. And together we are? Lolita Productions. <laughs> Oh, you wanted me to say it that time. We got this. We got this. You All get right. it? We're going to Hi, I'm Brianna Ramirez Smith. I'm Marisa Diaz Arce. And together we are Lolita Productions. Okay. <laughs> we are the uh, co creators of Lolita's Bodega here in Humboldt Park. Mm -hmm. We are co jefas. Yeah, co mines, neighbors, neighbors. <laughs> best friends, uh, <laughs> sisters, pretty much. Yeah. And Lolita's Bodega really is a Latinx pop-up market here in the heart of Humboldt Park. We began in 2019 um, as a way to stave off gentrification and pour back into our community. And we're very proudly Puerto Rican. And Humboldt Park is one of the last mainstays for us as a, in our culture. And it's, it's slowly being gentrified out. You go through the park and you see families, you see sports, you see older people playing dominoes, people just hanging out. And it is so important that we continue to have that for future generations. I believe the statistic is that 60% of all dollars from small businesses go right back into the community that they're in. And if you're spending money mindfully in your community, it allows you to stave off that small business from having to leave. At the bodega, you are definitely going to find the vendors um, reflect the community. Clothing to art, creative wares like candles, incense. We have jewelers, like my ring is actually from one. My earrings are from an artisan, <laughs> from a local artisan. Our t-shirts, yep. this is from someone who lives on Division Street. Some of them, unfortunately, due to the way things are going, have had to leave, um, whether that be their generation or their pre the previous generation. And so if we just became more conscious of where we're putting our money mm -hmm. into, um, we can definitely change the trajectory of what is happening to our neighborhood. That's the only way we're going to thrive is if we invest in each other. Be an active participant in your neighborhood. Actually put in some work and, and help out the community organizations that are struggling or, and working hard to make sure that the community is receiving the resources that it needs. If we don't do something about it, it's going to be done to us. And I would rather go out with a fight then sit here and allow something to happen to me. There's a lot of magic happening in our spaces. Look for those places that have magic because you can buy something that will be worth something a lot more later on, right from our own community. Hmm. Lolita's Bodega is back in action in Humboldt Park tomorrow. You can find more information on that and watch more in our La Ultima Palabra series on our website. And that's our show for this Saturday night. Join Brandis Friedman tomorrow night for Chicago Tonight Black Voices. And on Monday night at 8, join this month's Chicago Tonight Latino Voices Community Conversation. We're talking with Latinx LGBTQ leaders in Chicago about Pride Month and the Latinx LGBTQ experience. Again, that's Monday evening at 8. Visit WTTW.com voices to RSVP. Don't forget you can catch my reporting on 91.5 FM WBEZ. 
Next week on Latino Voices, Alex Hernandez with Univision Chicago will be here in the host chair. We leave you tonight with a corrido from Jesus Chuy Negrete, the Chicago activist and folk singer who died late last month at the age of 72. He performed his corrido about General John J. Pershing in a 1997 interview with the legendary Studs Turco, who dubbed Negrete the Chicano Woody Guthrie. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Michael Puente. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy, stay safe. Buenas noches. Cuando los güeros llegaron a Chihuahua Pidiendo sándwiches, los Twinkies y el jamón Pancho Villa les dio en la pip Y que viva la revolución Well, Pershing, he never caught Villa Pershing was a graduate of one of the highest military academies of the United States, West Point. He came to look for Villa, state of Durango, Pancho Villa. Not even a fourth grade education, pero bien trucha el cabrón. One time he told his men, take the shoes off your horses and put them on backwards. So when Pershing went south, Villa, he went north. <laughs> Well, Pershing, he went back to fight in the First World War. He became a war hero. Via, he died of natural causes. Three bullet holes to the chest. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives. At the railroad depot at a place called El Paso, Texas.